Okay. Well, um, good morning, everyone. We have Dr. Andrew Beck uh, today with us uh, as our guest faculty at Health for the World. Um, Dr. Beck is an attending physician in the Division of General and Community Pediatrics. Uh, he at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. He is also an associate professor at University of Cincinnati Department of Pediatrics. He did his MD from University of Pittsburgh and thereafter did an MPH from Harvard uh, School of Public Health as well. He, his work is um, um, on population health outcomes, improving population health outcomes by focusing uh, on the social, economic, and environmental determinants of health as well. So this, uh, this talk uh, would be very useful as uh, you all are out there uh, not just thinking about one patient but caring for um, um, the whole population that you're caring for in, in the region there. So. Wonderful. Uh, thanks again, um, Andrew, for uh, joining us today, and we look forward to your talk. Well, thank you for that introduction, and let me just first say that I'm, I'm fairly humbled and grateful to have this opportunity to speak to um, people from around the world. Um, the reality is that much of my work um, relates to how we uh, do business, how we care for patients here in the United States, but I think there are some generalizable concepts, concepts that I think um, have application all around the world, and even more importantly, perhaps, um, we here in the United States can learn quite a bit from uh, those who are caring for patients all around the world. So um, I hope I provide some insights today that are useful to those uh, listeners, but I similarly hope that it may spark some conversations about um, how we might learn from one another moving forward. So with that in mind, this is the area in which I'd like to focus um, our time together today. I'll start by trying to build the case for population health improvement and health equity, what those uh, concepts mean and how we might achieve them. I'd like to define factors underlying disparities in how children experience asthma morbidity and then make the jump to other conditions as well, suggesting that it's not just asthma uh, that we might think about. We may uh, take some of those same principles and apply them to other conditions. In so doing, I'd like to introduce strategies aimed at understanding and then reacting to disparities in health-promoting ways, again, ways that may have application for asthma but may extend beyond asthma too. So with that, getting, with that kind of frame set, I'd like to get started uh, thinking about how we might move towards population health and population health improvement by, by a focus on health equity. And uh, I'm going to define these terms in a moment, but uh, one of the central themes I'd like to highlight over the course of our time together this morning is the importance of context on health and how stark contextual differences can often lead to disparities that we aim to close. This picture I found on the web um, is from Sao Paulo and to me illustrates what, what uh, stark differences can uh, be seen in very short and small spaces. So on the left of this picture, you see uh, the Parasopolis neighborhood uh, within Sao Paulo, and on the right, you see uh, kind of a walled off region to a luxury high rise apartment. And it's these stark differences that can often occur within feet of one another that can have parallel differences in health outcomes that we aim to uh, narrow and improve. So I'd like to think about this uh, kind of context uh, importance as we move into this concept of population health improvement. So first, some definitions. Um, many of you are probably familiar with these definitions, or at least uh, the concepts um, are likely pervasive in the care that you provide every day. But there are some important differences between what we think about as equity and what we think about as equality. Equity has been defined as, by the World Health Organization as the absence of avoidable or remediable differences among groups of people. Now still, in clinical settings, particularly in the United States, we often provide equal care even if the risk differs. If this is the case, we often see ourselves finding avoidable outcome differences or disparities. 
What I'd like to promote is this concept of equitable care that matches need to resource. And often this will target what will come next in our discussion, which are the contextual or social determinants of health. Now here, one way to depict this concept of equality versus equity is the picture that you see on the right of the slide. Now, I'm a baseball fan, I'm a Pirates fan, which is the team in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania here in the United States. But what you see um, beyond the baseball game that is occurring are three young children trying to watch that game. Now, on the left, you see that the topography of the ground underneath these children is quite different. You see that the height of the fence is quite different. Now, if we provided the same support to each of these children, that one box for them to stand on, some kids would be able to see the game and some would not. Now, the concept of equity is a little bit different. It's uh, changing the number of boxes, the number of supports we provide to match need to resource. Now, one could consider how we move toward equity and perhaps justice, this concept of getting rid of the fence in the first place, trying to figure out why the ground is of different levels in the first place. How can we move toward those concepts within the uh, realm of the care we provide? This is another way to think of the, this kind of difference between equality and equity, uh, particularly in the realm of health care. Um, this is a diagram uh, developed by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, that, again, highlights this potential benefit of matching need to resource. The top is equality. You see uh, four different people, four different size people, people with different abilities. If we provided them all with the same bicycle, Either that bicycle may not work for them or it may not work well. The bottom is more equity. How can we change the size, shape, and structure of that bicycle so as to meet the need in the most appropriate ways? Now, to identify what those needs are, we have to think about what the social determinants of health are. This is another uh, term concept that has become uh, popular in the realm of healthcare uh, delivery and health understanding. Um, this is a definition also that comes from the World Health Organization, but there are countless organizations both in the United States and internationally that are starting to think about this concept um, and uh, tie it in meaningful ways to the way in which we deliver care. The World Health Organization definition is depicted here on the left, and I'll, I'll highlight a few aspects of it. It really understands what conditions are in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age and the wider set of forces and systems that shape the conditions of daily life. And I will mention that what those systems are include economic systems, policies, other historical um, realms that can get into segregation and discrimination, key contextual factors that will determine the way in which an individual is able to live their life. In the United States um, and abroad, I think we can all think about what are some social, economic, and physical contextual factors rooted in the environment. And for me, what I, I sometimes like to think of pictures, and I um, pulled a, a set of pictures um, over the course of the last couple years from here in the U.S. that depict, in my mind, the social, economic, and physical environments in which our patients and ourselves live our lives. And I think they can be both positive and negative. The first two pictures I would consider aspects of the social environment. Um, several months ago, uh, close to my hometown of Cincinnati, um, there was a mass shooting in a city called Dayton just up the road from us. I would suggest that this depicted some of the best and worst of humanity. The top picture illustrates those comforting one another across cultures, across backgrounds, all in the realm of trying to lift that community up. The bottom is the antithesis of that. It's uh, protests um, on the part of some of our right-wing uh, factions here in the U.S. Um, that are instead trying to pull our country apart. The economic environment, environment may um, influence access to resources. Here are two pictures, once again, the top picture from a uh, grocery store that has access to tremendous fruits and vegetables, wonderful resources that are affordable for those that come. The bottom picture is the only uh, fruit and vegetable access for some of our patients in one of the neighborhoods close to my hospital. 
And then the last set of pictures uh, depicts two bedrooms. The top bedroom was uh, where my daughter slept when she was uh, quite a bit younger. Um, it's nothing um, overly special, but it's clean, it's healthy, and there's no um, environmental factors that could um, uh, promulgate a negative health, health outcome. The bottom picture, however, is one taken from the room of one of my other patients from my clinic. And what you see here is a room filled with black mold that is likely influencing the degree to which she has respiratory symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. Indeed, all factors rooted in the social determinants of health that could either promote the best possible outcomes or lead to more negative outcomes. And it's these differences in what we experience with respect to risks and assets that drive those equity gaps, those disparities we aim to close. The concept of population health, which is uh, one of the last terms I wanted to uh, define uh, to orient ourselves, is uh, one that is also gaining uh, a foothold in the realm of both clinical care and public health. And here what it highlights is the health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of those outcomes, which means that it's not okay to just think about the average set of outcomes across a group. We also must think about the distribution. If we see wide variation um, indicative of gaps or disparities, um, we are not necessarily um, bridging the gap of population health. And I think a good example of this from my own community is represented by these two neighborhoods, which are separated by just a few miles but have huge variability in the experience of both morbidity and mortality, a 20-year life expectancy gap separating uh, separated by just a few miles. And I, I would suggest that we can see this neighborhood to neighborhood, community com to community, as well as country to country, as we think about gaps across our world. So with this concept of population health rooted in the difference between equity and equality, driven by social or contextual determinants of health, I'd like to, to move into this concept of upstream context uh, for asthma morbidity and inequitable population health outcomes. When I say upstream, it's those factors that may be prevented um, or uh, leveraged as we seek to improve those outcomes that are more distal or more downstream. And as the uh, picture illustrates, often many of us may live on rivers or close to waterways. Um, the quality of the water that streams past us is likely driven by factors that may be many miles, many kilometers um, upstream of us. And until we think about those factors, we may not truly meet the, need, uh, meet the needs of our populations. So I'd like to raise two uh, cases. One was a case of a girl I saw during a, a medical trip to Honduras in Central America. Uh, the other is one from Cincinnati, but let me start um, with this child who I saw a few, year, uh, a few years back. Um, She's a three-year-old, almost four-year-old girl who we saw as we were uh, meeting her within her home. Uh, she had increased work of breathing. Um, she had persistent cough. She was wheezing. And we stepped inside her home and tried to get a little bit more history from her, her mother and found that inside her home, uh, they had an indoor cooking mechanism. Uh, there was black uh, uh, blackness on both the ceiling and the walls, which you can kind of appreciate, but um, it's not so easy to see in this picture. There was not much ventilation in the home. And so the plan, apropos to uh, pretty consistent management of asthma, was that we wanted to provide her with, an, um, with albuterol to inhale. We wanted to provide her with steroids to tamp down the inflammation. We wanted to think about some preventive education that could get put into place over the long term. But we also had to think upstream, think about those factors that may determine how uh, this family and others within this particular community uh, ventilated uh, their in-home cooking uh, kitchens. Uh, and we thought that that was likely to be far more impactful on her long-term health and well-being than short-term albuterol. Now, let's think of a similar or parallel case from Cincinnati. This is a pretty typical uh, presentation for us, as I'm sure it is for you as well, that a child gets hospitalized with difficulty breathing. He had a history of multiple admissions for asthma to the hospital. He was ill appearing. He was working hard to breathe, coughing, wheezing. And we have a 
uh, clinical care protocol that is uh, pretty typical and pretty standardized, and he got admitted for albuterol, steroids, and inpatient management. It still begs the question, though, of what challenges might he face in his home environment? What role does context play in his morbidity? Was there anything that could have been prevented to make this admission less likely? And so if we stepped into his home, and again, here are three pictures from the homes of uh, local children with asthma. Uh, we see um, uh, indication of pests like cockroaches, which we know to influence asthma morbidity. We see water damage and mold. We see falling in ceilings. Um, and then if we asked further questions, we'd see transportation barriers as well, making it difficult for him to uh, get to the doctor for preventive care. Now, our plan for him must, looked um, in many ways very similar to the plan we had for our child in Honduras. He got albuterol, he got steroids, some uh, preventive education. But we also started to think about advocacy around exposures and access which may um, not only help him in the acute um, phase of his illness, but may also prevent him from experiencing such morbidity in the future. On our own wards, these um, qualitative or quotes uh, that come directly from our patients, I think, illustrate this point to a still greater degree, all quotes directly from patients of our hospitalized children. One noting that my window is broken, there, roach, there are roaches, and my landlord isn't responsive to my concerns. Another highlighting the challenges to uh, get their preventive medicines, that it takes four hours to get to the pharmacy, two hours to get there walking, and two hours to get back. I just can't do it. Another noted that I don't have transportation. I have to catch the bus everywhere. Um, and this uh, particular situation happened in a very hot uh, spring and summer where um, this family noted that with him having a breathing problem, they were scared to catch the bus, scared to get into that heat of the day and the pollution of the bus. And then a, a final example is that this particular family was in the hospital with no one, no food, no gas. It was just horrible because this mother was breastfeeding another child, and she noted that she was basically eating nothing but cereal or a little scrap that she doesn't eat the child that I could sneak in before the doctors come and see. So real challenges that our families face before, during, and after a, an acute event that will limit the ability um, to achieve full recovery, achieve full potential. Now, let me provide a little bit of data highlighting the need. Now, this is um, U.S. data on asthma prevalence. Um, it is available from our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, you can see that overall the uh, prevalence of asthma has increased slightly, um, though this uh, data is somewhat old. You see that it tops out in 2010. We see that the exacerbation or attack rates are somewhat steady, um, but that more than half, nearly 60% of children with asthma have at least one exacerbation or attack per year, um, symptoms that are potentially preventable. Now, if we look um, more um, at what those acute attacks or acute exacerbations look like um, for kids, we see that uh, it's roughly 10 visits per every 100 children with asthma per year um, for emergency department visits. Um, we see that this rate is higher among underrepresented minority children in this country, often um, our black or African American populations, as well as our Hispanic or Latino populations. We see, we see that children are far more affected, affected than adults. And we see that the hospitalization rate for children is about two to three um, per 100 children with asthma per year, very similar to ED visits. We also see happily um, that asthma-related deaths are decreasing, but they still occur, and there still remains that gap between, say, the black lines and the blue lines, indicative of limitations on our ability to achieve population health. Again, not just improving the outcome, but improving the outcome uh, equitably for all. Now, if we look more closer to home um, in Cincinnati, I, I want to show um, some of our own data. Um, this is a map of Hamilton County, which is uh, basically the uh, municipal region of the city of Cincinnati here in, um, in um, southwest Ohio in the, middle, in the midwestern part of the United States. Um, this map um, shows um, subdivisions by neighborhoods, which are very important within our community 
Um, just about everybody knows the neighborhood and identifies strongly with the neighborhood in which they live. The neighborhoods colored in dark red are those with a very high admission rates, and the nose, th those colored in more of a yellow color are those with relatively low admission rates. And if you can see where that star is depicted in the middle, that's where our hospital is located, right in that sea of dark red. This is the same data just displayed in a slightly different way. If you look at this chart on the right, the y-axis is that admission rate normalized per population, so per thousand children per year, and the x-axis are the 80 or 90 neighborhoods within our community. And again, what this shows is that huge variability from left to right, with some neighborhoods having an admission rate roughly 10 times the national average and others on the far right doing quite a bit bigger, quite a, quite a bit better. Some, in fact, having no admissions during this study period. So again, with this significant neighborhood to neighborhood variability, we found ourselves um, with uh, population health disparities. Again, uh, an inequitable distribution of the outcome we're, we're, we're attempting to improve. So why? So if we look at those neighborhoods on the far left, it's not just random which ones they are. They're more likely to be those, like the case I presented before, to have children who lack reliable transportation, to be exposed uh, to challenging in-home situations, adverse environments, and, to, more, uh, to, and uh, to be more likely to live in poverty and experience the risks and challenges of poverty. So it's not, um, it's not just a random distribution, it's an inequitable distribution rooted in the social determinants of health. And just a little bit more evidence behind why this is relevant and important um, is that uh, there is strong evidence to suggest um, links between asthma morbidity and exposures like cockroaches, dust mites, mold and mildew, certain chemical irritants or inhaled al allergens, all of which are more common in some of the same neighborhoods that I mentioned before, some of those same um, areas of the world that live um, and experience poverty to greater degrees. We also see that these exposures um, are common and lead to increased symptom days, increased unscheduled visits, increased asthma attacks, those attacks that we're attempting to avoid. These, um, I, I also just wanted to show uh, fairly quickly, are indicative of the difference in which, uh, difference in care that's de delivered in certain settings. So I'm gonna show two uh, of these uh, kind of time series run charts. Um, and basically what they're showing is all the medication fills for controller or preventive medicines, that's in green, um, and all the fills for um, albuterol or asthma-related rescue medicines in red over time. And this comes from one of our biggest pharmacies here locally. Now, the first um, one is looking at uh, controller and rescue fills in our healthier neighborhoods, those with less utilization and, in fact, less poverty as well. And the key take home here is that the line for the controller medicine, the preventive medicine, is higher at nearly every time point than the rescue. I'm going to flip to this one now. This is the same um, uh, structure of the data except in those um, more unhealthy neighborhoods, those neighborhoods with more exacerbations and more poverty. And here you can see that the rescue line is higher than the controller line at nearly every time of year. So again, it's not just exposures, but it's the care that is being delivered at the end. So how can we work both at the upstream as well as the downstream? Part of this is thinking about that contextual risk in meaningful ways. We use maps quite a bit. I would suggest that maps and understanding the, the kind of breadth of neighborhoods and neighborhood distribution of both risks and assets is a strategy that could have widespread application. This is a layered map that you see on the right. At the top are all asthma-related emergency visits and hospitalizations, and at the bottom are Cincinnati neighborhoods. And you can see measures across the board ranging from exposure to violence, exposure to poverty, exposure to uh, adverse housing, access to care. And one might think about these different contextual risks, mapping a particular individual from the top down to their particular neighborhood, understanding the risks and assets um, you might experience along the way. 
One may also consider it more of a public health approach starting at the neighborhood level, thinking about what characterizes that neighborhood, both good and bad, and then at the end, what the health outcome is for that neighborhood as a whole. And so in this particular situation, if you think back to the case of the child I introduced a moment ago, could we have understood more readily whether the um, lack of car or reliable transportation could have affected this child in a meaningful way? Presence of mold or an adverse in-home environment, uh, challenges meeting um, their uh, nutritional needs by having lack of exposure or access to healthy uh, food, perhaps some mental health challenges within the home that may limit their ability to navigate a complex care system. Again, all an understanding of contextual risk which may help them to navigate the needs of their day-to-day. -day. So um, for the rest of my time, I want to move from some of these contextual challenges, both um, po uh, the positive aspects one might face and negative aspects to think about real strategies one might use to improve health and reduce disparities. And I'd like to start with a mention of our hospital's asthma improvement collaborative. Many of you are probably familiar with the model for improvement. Um, it has uh, largely been driven by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which uh, promotes its use um, in healthcare settings across the world. For us, we use this model, which in essence um, articulates what a goal is, determines strategies to meet that goal, and uh, uses rapid cycle testing to um, achieve progress. We use this to devise an aim around asthma back a number of years ago. We began with a bold aim and this common method and sought to reduce hospitalizations by 20% in children with asthma covered by Medicaid. Medicaid in the United States is a, a public health insurance plan, uh, which many of our more impoverished uh, children are covered under. Our strategies uh, through this uh, included uh, changes uh, devised to how we pro provided care in the hospital setting, in the primary care or prevention setting, and in collaboration with partners within the community or the neighborhood itself. In the hospital, we worked to provide uh, both rescue and uh, preventive or controller medications in hand prior to a child being discharged. We also expanded our assessments and ability to intervene upon um, adverse environmental conditions. So if a child had mold in their home or uh, cockroaches in their home, we tried to identify that risk more efficiently and then connect that child to a citywide resource um, designed to uh, provide more healthy environments for tenants. In the primary or preventive care realm, we worked with care coordinators and increasingly now community health workers to try and make uh, care uh, more right-sized right for that patient. Much like some of the diagrams I showed before, we tried to right-size that fit of the bicycle for the patient and the family that we were seeing. Some of this involved pre-visit planning, some of this involved medication delivery programs whereby medications were delivered directly to the doors um, or the homes of the child. Some of it involved more coordinated care with uh, schools. Finally, within the community, we set up uh, community partnerships with those experts on the ground who may be better suited to uh, handling uh, social determinants than we may be in the medical field. These include uh, public health officials across our city. These include attorneys and legal advocates who are uh, poised to help uh, uh, individuals navigate their own legal rights. And it also, of course, includes schools, too, where so many of our kids spend so much of their day. Some of the hospital-based improvements I mentioned a moment ago, again, related to medication delivery, follow-up appointments being made, asthma action plans in place, and these equity-minded additions to care, which uh, tried to think about the context, both um, a program called CLEAR, where we brought those environmental supports to bear, home health visits, where we had nurses um, and community health workers go out into the homes to meet families where they were, and social workers who could also help us uh, identify risk more readily and uh, intervene more directly. In primary care, I mentioned some of these uh, a moment ago, so I won't dwell, but I will highlight that we tried to move uh, towards this concept of pattern recognition so that we weren't just managing 
single children, but we were also trying to learn from each um, management approach so that we could provide better care for our entire population. I mentioned maps a moment ago. We use maps frequently to, again, chart these types of patterns. Um, asthma and housing are known to be linked, and one of the things we've done is begin to overlay those data elements in meaningful ways that we can then share with experts. So uh, this is a map of the Avondale neighborhood, which is located very close to us and is uh, characterized by quite a bit of uh, social determinant-related need. Each dot represents um, a patient in our primary care center. Those dots colored in red are patients who have a diagnosis of asthma. When we showed some of these data to our housing experts, our legal aid partners, they uh, were able to identify certain building complexes um, that uh, they deemed to be at particularly high risk for housing problems. We looked at the prevalence of asthma um, and the likelihood of asthma attack within these buildings, and they were all well above uh, where we would expect them to be. And this has prompted building level action, including tenant associations and advocacy with the city for repairs. So again, moving from a single patient to a cluster of patients, almost as though we were dealing with uh, an infectious outbreak. Similarly, we've worked with, uh, with pharmacies. Here's a map of the same neighborhood. Uh, we've identified that the vast majority of prescriptions or medications written for uh, neighborhood patients go to one of four retail pharmacies, so we've explored partnerships with them, tried to figure out why certain patients fill or don't fill their medicines, and tried to figure out how we can make um, filling medications easier um, for those in need. We've also measured our uh, progress over time, and uh, the two uh, graphs on the right indicate that progress. Um, we've looked at um, the hospitalization and emergency department visit rates over time for our patients. And we found that uh, given these kind of phased approaches in uh, the hospital, in primary care, and in the community, we've been able to reduce hospitalizations by uh, and emergency department vi visits both by more than 40%, as well as a rehospitalization measure um, within 30 days from 12% to 7%. But there's much more to do, and there's um, also much more um, opportunity to extend the learning from asthma to other conditions as we work towards spread and scale. One thing to underscore is that the disparities we see in asthma and the uh, contents and characteristics of those disparities are repeated across diagnoses. So the top uh, figure represents disparities in preterm birth rates. The bottom in psychiatric hospitalization or admission rates, and this one for all-cause inpatient bed day rates, so any reason why a child would be hospitalized. And the point here is not to um, look at the individual neighborhoods in any of these, but it's to suggest that there are broad disparities across these conditions, and the neighborhoods that tend to be on the far left for asthma are the same neighborhoods that tend to be on the far left for preterm birth, for psychiatric admission rates and indeed for all cause hospitalizations and bed days. One way to underscore this point is by looking at this figure, and let me orient you. So the y-axis here is the bed day rate per thousand children uh, within uh, groups of neighborhoods. So this is, again, any reason for a child to be hospitalized divided by the population within that neighborhood. The first uh, one here is asthma. So the top of the blue bar represents the asthma bed day rate for the Avondale neighborhood. The gold bar that's kind of in the middle represents the, um, the county average. And the green bar is representative of the healthiest uh, sets of neighborhoods, the healthiest quarter of neighborhoods within our county. And so it's the gap between the top of the blue and the orange which illustrates the gap between Avondale and the average uh, of our county, and the green is the gap between Avondale and the best off. So that huge um, gap that, is, uh, that we can be capable of closing. But the point here is that it's not just asthma, it's also true for sickle cell disease, for viral infections, um, for epilepsy, for fractures, for diabetes, for pretty much every condition we assess there's a um, sizable and preventable, uh, potentially preventable difference between the top of that blue bar 
and what we see in orange and green. This um, highlighted a strategic plan that our hospital put forth a number of years ago, back in about 2015, to say that we could do better and that uh, to do so, we really wanted to ensure that our children were the healthiest in our nation, in part by um, enabling strong community partnerships. And this bold strategic plan came with four main measures. We sought to eliminate or at least improve infant mortality rates, ensure that all of our five-year-olds have a healthy mind and body, and in part identifying ways in which that measurement could be um, uh, uh, defined. We wanted to work with our school district to help children read proficiently by third grade in equitable ways. And we also wanted to reduce that disparity between um, pre potentially preventable admissions and pre preventable bed days across our neighborhoods. And this is an area where I've spent a lot of my time over the last five years, again, trying to think about how we might improve outcomes in equitable ways. Here are our areas of focus. They probably look very similar because they were built to top what we pursued for asthma. We focused on the child and the family. How could we assess risk in meaningful ways? How could we deploy resources with equity in mind? At a health system level, how could we learn from each hospitalization? How could we partner wild, widely with our communities, with our families, to ensure that we were right size and care? And how could we uh, identify patterns with our communities to go upstream and prevent morbidity as opposed to just responding it to it when it gets to us. And I will say that we're making progress. One of the ways we measure our outcome is by looking at uh, monthly data um, over time. So the chart that you're seeing on the right is called a control chart. It's looking at bed day rates um, per month um, for two target neighborhoods in greater Cincinnati. And there are statistical rules that allow us to determine when we've made a significant change or a significant improvement. And we see that that occurred around uh, the summer of 2015 when we started this work, corresponding to an 18 to 20% decrease in the rate at which kids from these two neighborhoods are spending days in the hospital. Then a positive shift indicative of population health improvement. The graph that you see on the right are comparison neighborhoods. We wanted to make sure that we weren't just picking up on background trends, and given that we see no change here, no decrease, um, we're confident that we are making progress, that we still have sizable uh, room to grow. So as I close, I'd like to think about where we might go from here. How might, how might I summarize what I've, I've described in uh, potentially meaningful ways? Uh, one, I'd suggest that achieving population health could really benefit from getting uh, to shared root causes across conditions and specialties. This is where I think we can all learn so much together, given that some of those shared root causes are likely common across our entire world. I think a deeper understanding of community, of context in which uh, children, families um, experience their health and well-being can help us to uh, guide our assessments, our referrals, our interventions, and indeed our partnerships. I think all of us in the medical field, certainly those of us um, who care for patients, have a professional responsibility and, in fact, motivation to move toward action. And I think uh, the point that I made at the start, that we all must learn from one another, as well as from our patients and communities as we work to enact change. So to conclude, I, I, I hope I've uh, highlighted the point that context influences multiple dimensions of health and disease, it's true for asthma, it's true for many other conditions as well. Dimensions that can help us to quantify and track disparities, identify root causes and point us toward action. This is a picture of Pittsburgh, which used to be my home city. It's also the start of the Ohio River, which is the river that runs through Cincinnati. So in fact, it is upstream of Cincinnati. And I, I wanted to show this again to highlight the point that we can work upstream to support children, families, and patients so that we can not just manage the acute manifestation of disease, the asthma attack, but also think about both primary and secondary prevention to ensure that that attack and perhaps that diagnosis of asthma doesn't occur. And I think part of what will get us there is by collectively focusing on health. How do we achieve the best uh, possible health for our patients as opposed to merely falling back into the healthcare provision 
uh, that we uh, proceed with? How can we ensure that healthcare is provided the best that it can be, but in the name of in service to the health of our patients? So I'm going to close there. Um, I hope, again, that this is the start of a much longer conversation where we can learn from one another. And I have included some of my contact information here um, that I hope uh, you'll use if you have your own ideas, your own questions, your own comments, or your own um, insights that may help us all to provide better care for our patients and for our populations. Thank you very much.